The 2020 presidential elections are over, but not for everyone. And many of the issues that concern millions of people like you who live in New York, in many states, in America, and not surprisingly, many countries in the world still exist. My guests to discuss many of these troubling issues and the resulting chaos are United States Congresswoman Yvette Clark, New York Deputy Commissioner of Health and Mental Hygiene, Dr. Corian Easterling, and Reverend Alfred Cockfield, pastor of God's Battalion Church in Brooklyn. So where do we begin? COVID-19, allegations of rigged elections, and the support Trump received from so many religious leaders. Let's begin with you, Congressman Clark. Uh, my, my opening question to you is, how do we get the country back to decency? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. I think that the Biden-Harris administration will uh, really usher in a, a, a period of unity. And I think there is a, a common foe uh, across all uh, divisions, and that is the COVID-19 virus. To the extent that there's been a lot of propaganda and politicizing of this virus. What we are seeing across this nation with the rampant spread of the virus, it's hitting uh, red states and blue states. It's hitting rural communities and urban communities. And I think that the rallying cry to uh, crush this virus will uh, trump, for lack of a better term, a whole lot of the division uh, that we have seen. However, you know, we have to be very clear that this is a nation uh, of different people, different backgrounds with, uh, you know, different focus in terms of policy. And that there will, to a certain extent, always be some level of division. However, I believe that uh, with the Biden-Harris administration focused on healing the nation, literally healing the nation, there will be a moment where uh, we, can, uh, we can count on people working together to defeat the virus. Dr. Easterling, let me come to you about the virus. Uh, let me also say that we're going to have a follow-up program to this one where we're going to be discussing only the COVID virus. Um, but uh, let me ask you, Dr. Easterling, uh, what concerns you at this point about this virus? Um, I think the, the greatest concern about the virus is that the misinformation is probably more contagious than the virus itself. Mm. If you do not push back on the misinformation, uh, then we're certainly going to set ourselves up for more deaths. And I think that's the greatest concern. I think the other concern is we look at the numbers. Uh, we are uh, um, encroaching 250,000 deaths. We haven't seen this many deaths in a pandemic uh, since the 1918 flu pandemic, where we reached about 500,000 deaths. Uh, nearly 50 million people across the globe uh, were impacted by that flu pandemic. We're on our way there, and we could certainly uh, avert the number of people who've been impacted by the, uh, by the virus, the number of people who've died, the number of people who've been hospitalized. And so uh, to have the tools at our disposal, uh, to have uh, simple messaging at our disposal, uh, and the fact that we can avert the number of deaths that we can, the number of people who contract this virus, uh, is most concerning. Uh, to me. Uh, we are an industrialized nation. We have uh, you know, interventions, technologies. Uh, we know what we need to do. The reason why we are even talking about a vaccine is because we have the infrastructure and the technology at our disposal, and we live through not nearly as large, uh, you know, even in my lifetime, but we've lived through outbreaks uh, like H1N1, even here in New York City. And because of the H1N1 outbreak, we have been, we have, we're positioned well 
uh, to really make sure that we can uh, control the spread and also uh, be able to distribute a vaccine when it is available. Uh, and these are, this is information that we have across the country. And so I think it's being able to leverage our public health tools, making sure that we are messaging correctly uh, and really leaning on our experts, both nationwide and locally. Uh, you talked about having the tools. Um, Reverend Caulfield, I know that you have done this separation in churches. Uh, you, many churches have even more than the mandatory six feet. But what are the tools that members of your congregation are saying to you that they do not have? I mean, you know, I think to Dr. Easton's point, you know, we are in a city of great access. While the city was hit by a storm with the COVID-19, I think months later, we've seen that the New York City has been able to, New York State on a whole, been be able to rise and make sure we have the equipment, PPE, the masks, the hand sanitizers, everything that our, doesn't matter what economic background you're from, you're able to have that in your hand. And that, what we didn't have that back in February and March, but we do have that now in the city of New York. And even in my church, you, you, you have people that are frightened, scared, even with all those equipments to come out. Uh, some undocumented folks don't want to come out. You know, there, there is the, the tension and fear is on all aspects and COVID-19 just compounds it. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, this divisiveness, the inflammatory politics that you referred to earlier, the, the decision by the president that he is not going to respect the decisions of the electorate. What are you doing about this in Washington? Well, we're moving forward with the transition. Um, it is very clear uh, that it, from the outset that Donald Trump was going to contest this election. Uh, he did everything within his power to undermine the integrity of the election, starting with the Postal Service, a lot of the propaganda he put out there, essentially, you know, trying to uh, gaslight the American people with respect to uh, their ability to vote and what the outcome would be prior to their even being voting. And so we are focused here in Washington on transitioning. Uh, it's difficult without having the cooperation of the administration, you're not getting uh, up-to-date information from agency heads. However, we recognize that on January 20th, there will be a transition of power from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. And therefore, we are preparing for that now. The transition team uh, is being uh, populated. Uh, websites have been set up for individuals who are interested in serving in the administration. And, uh, you know, I think that to the extent that we present a contrast to uh, the chaos that Donald Trump presents to the American people, it gives uh, uh, not only domestically a sigh of relief to the American people, but as you can see by the response coming from global leaders, uh, a sigh of relief uh, globally and internationally that there will be some level of return to partnership and to uh, a rational <laughs> uh, 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 interactions between the United States and their allies around the world. So, you know, we, we, we don't want to be distracted. Um, we are allowing, you know, the courts to do what they do. Um, we are focused on making sure that, one, uh, we um, work to help uh, the Senate fill those last two seats with uh, Democrats, because I'm a Democrat, so I'm just going to put it where it is. Uh, there's a contest in Georgia that we are, uh, are, are working very hard uh, to support. And uh, that will put us in a good place in terms of advancing uh, the uh, Biden administration's 
uh, agenda, uh, which is an agenda for the people. You mentioned the word rational just now. Um, Reverend Cockfield, I can't resist this. There are a lot of people who are wondering about the decision of all of these religious leaders, these pastors, to support Donald Trump. And, and they're very silent um, considering what is going on right now. But how, how do you feel about this and how do your, 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 fellow, your, your fellow members of the cloth, how are, what, what do they feel about the support that he's gotten from these persons um, in other states, several other states, and uh, their silence? Yeah, they're silent, they're silent about uh, the, their real morals. They say that the President Trump is not their religious leader. That's part of the reason why they folks, but I, I, I take it, I, I put it aside. I said, listen, if you're concerned about pro-life, concerned about all these different issues, what about the young black boys that's being murdered in these streets in the country, across the country? Are their life not valuable? You're silent in there as well. And you see a lot of those churches that a lot of their black congregants are walking away because on a Sunday morning after a George Floyd killing, pastor was silent. No comment, nothing, had nothing to contribute to the conversation. And this is a problem in a lot of the evangelical circles and denominations around the country. My dad, who's an Assemblies of God, a day minister, his denomination, a lot of them are uh, pro-Trump, pro-Republican, and I, I don't care what party you're from, decency and order and life and, and moral issues and ethical issues and the stuff that we see coming out of the White House on the last four years, three years, is unbelievable that they can still openly support, openly support and endorse the president. Blows me away. The president has been very silent on COVID. Uh, Dr. Easterling, uh, the, the, the president has not had kind words at all to say to professionals, to say about professionals like you, to say about scientists, uh, to say about doctors all over this country. And uh, many people have asked the question, if he had recognized, if he had recognized that COVID was a problem, as he probably had been told, would it have been different today? Yeah, without, without question. Uh, I think there's enough data, uh, enough science to show that uh, if we were able to act quickly, uh, if we were able to message quickly, uh, not having uh, clear orders about wearing a face mask, uh, not having uh, governmental support ensuring that tests were available, certainly put uh, vulnerable uh, Americans at risk even more uh, and we're certainly seeing across this country that uh, there are a number of different states where more than half of their population are not wearing masks uh, and so we need uh, science to really lead uh, you know the guidelines and we know what we need to do uh, I mean it, it's very clear when we've been able to push back uh, on the spread of COVID-19 as we saw uh, really during um, the spring uh, and really concerning numbers around those who were hospitalized and those who died, uh, we certainly do not want to see a, a repeat uh, of, of April. Um, and if we know that it, there are face masks that we should be wearing, individuals should be getting tested, I think we need to be clear about, and, and officials and leaders need to be saying just that. Um, and I think we also need to be clear about how uh, this virus has disproportionately impacted uh, black and brown people across this country. Um, and certainly here in New York City, our data has consistently and persistently shown that disproportionate impact. But we're continuing to see this uh, in the Midwest, in the West, as there are a number of Latino uh, residents who are being impacted. And we're seeing it as well in other jurisdictions where uh, the cases were, were high as well uh, in, in, in March and April. Uh, and so uh, we haven't been able to control and remove the conditions. 
uh, that have led to those disproportionate impacts. And so again, le learning from our uh, from the lessons uh, just just during wave one, then we know those disproportionate impacts are going to continue if we're not being vigilant about following the preventative uh, measures that we have already we know to be good. Congresswoman Clark, you represent a largely Black and Hispanic uh, group of residents. Uh, we now have the first Black woman to be to be named to be vice president. How does that make you feel? I know there are lots of brown people who are extremely happy and excited about that. But what do you think that will that will bring about? What changes do you think that will result in? Well, it's indeed. It, 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 Indeed, it's historic uh, to have the first ever woman, black woman uh, of Caribbean descent, of Indian descent, to be elected to one of the highest offices in our land. It, I think that there's a sense of pride that uh, many Americans feel uh, to see that day come. Um, you know, it, 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 it's almost equal to the elation that we felt when we elected President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my constituents, like so many people across this nation and around the world, are really anticipating her uh, arrival in the White House. Uh, it is very clear from her experience, her lived experiences, that she'll be able to relate to so many different people and their experiences and be able to be a policymaker that uh, is able to use that lived experience to advance policies that will, that will help uplift those communities that have been marginalized for, you know, for, for, for centuries in this nation. So I think that uh, aside from the fact that uh, she's the first, uh, Indo-Black woman, if you will, to be elected uh, to, to, to the high, one of the highest offices in our land, we have to remember she's also a senator. So she's very astute in terms of policies and she advanced a lot of very important issues as a senator. She's a former attorney general and the issue of, of, of racial justice of, of social justice, you know, is right within her ballywick. And so I think there's a lot of anticipation of her leadership and guidance uh, during this time where, uh, you know, we've, we've been hit with multiple pandemics uh, from COVID-19 to the economic crisis to the, the social justice and racial justice issues that have plagued us uh, alongside COVID-19. Uh, she will be able uh, to uh, articulate for the American people uh, a pathway forward that brings to the fore uh, ways in which we uh, depart from uh, the, the historic uh, discrimination, the historic bias uh, that has plagued our nation for, for far too long now. So I think there's a lot of excitement. People look at, you know, they know that she can relate to the immigrant experience, both of her parents being immigrants to the United States, her being a, a second generation American. Uh, they know that again, you know, her lived experiences are very similar to theirs. And so um, we're just excited, we're elated. Uh, it, is, it is just wonderful to be alive in this time to witness and be a part of uh, sort of a, a new chapter in the history of this nation. Robin Coffey, I see you shaking your head. Would you like to weigh in on this? And I'd like to hear you too, Dr. Dr. Easterling. Um, he, she is, uh, in a sense, like us. <laughs> uh, you, you see my, you see the my brown shade. Yeah. Uh, would, you like, would you like to weigh in on this? Definitely. I think she bring she she brings to little brown boys and little brown girls, just as uh, Congresswoman. Uh, elated, he alluded to when President Barack Obama became president. There was a sense of pride in the young boys and young girls' faces. I run schools and I, you see the excitement that they see 
And when they, they came back to school after the election, talking about Kamala Harris, now the vice president elect, uh, Jamaican background. So you have the Jamaicans shouting in the street, mm -hmm. you have the Indians shouting in the street. There's such pride in the Caribbean, and, and, and especially in a city like New York City, the possibilities for those who, folks who are parents are undocumented, the possibilities for them thinking about what future I can have, even in a crisis like not having my papers, the, the, the sky is the limit. And so I think the a sense of pride is that even after this administration that is currently occupying the White House, even with the racism that has spurred up and shown its face in the last four years that we've probably never seen in my particular lifetime, I've seen it on the tones, but not so bold face, Thank if you, you will, too. right? Yeah. And so now we have a sense of, you see a president, a white man, a vice president, black woman, is showing that, listen, we can bring this country together. Folks, can, doesn't matter where you're from. Matter of fact, no matter what's your color skin, we're all immigrants. <laughs> we were, yeah. we, somebody in our family came here and why we're here today. And so it doesn't matter what your race is, we should be able to grow, work together, have our children play together and start families. And I think Kamala's marriage is just a reflection. Doesn't matter. Love is better. Love conquers everything. And love is the essential piece of bringing the city and the country together. And so we see that exemplified in the elects coming into the White House, getting ready to occupy the White House. Mm -hmm. Dr. Easterling? Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with my panelists. I mean, this is huge. Uh, I think that this uh, creates a, a new narrative. Um, mm. You know, being a, an HBCU grad, you know, shout out to Howard University, because I, I, you know, it, I think it's, it sort of just creates this opportunity for people to see that if they're coming from historically Black College University, if they are a member of the Divine Nine, if they are an immigrant, that there are possibilities that mm -hmm. can certainly exceed, you know, sort of what you're you're envisioning for yourself. Uh, and I and I think that the other thing that you know we we also have to remind ourselves is just four months ago we were standing at knife's edge. We were coming out of this moment uh, after the murder of George Floyd. We were wondering whether we were going into chaos or were we going to go into community. And I think. This is giving us some hope that our actions can lead to better opportunities and better possibilities. And so I'm, I'm excited and I think it's also been uh, great to hear uh, Vice President-elect talk about and name how structural racism is playing out in uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And I know that she has also called for a task force uh, that's dealing with the racial inequity and justice around coronavirus and I do hope uh, that that task force is created, as I know that's part of the Biden-Harris administration plan. Uh, talk for a second about the, the racial inequities that's taking place around this whole COVID situation. Talk a yeah. bit about that. I'm sorry? Talk a bit about the racial inequities that we see in terms of who's getting COVID and in our, in our coming program, we'll be talking some more about the distribution of, 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 of these, uh, of, 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 I think they're talking about the, the vaccinations that will be made available and the fear is that these vaccinations are not going to be made available to uh, equally, uh, to, particularly to people of color. But talk a bit about the inequities, the, those persons who are suffering from this epidemic? Certainly. Uh, we, we have seen uh, during the course of the pandemic uh, disproportionate impact uh, to black and brown communities across uh, this country. Uh, and you know, this has been due to longstanding inequities uh, that have been experienced. And I think those health outcomes are not uh, related to biological or genetics, but we understand them to be social uh, and environmental impacts. Uh, and so when you are living in environments uh, overcrowded or, uh, or you're not dealing with, not having health insurance access, it has led to these impacts. So I think that this is an important point as we think about uh, vaccine planning as well that we have to keep in mind. 
So Dr. Dr. Easterling was uh, speaking to the social determinants of health. We are, I'm on the committee of jurisdiction here in the House of Representatives where I serve as vice chair, the Energy and Commerce Committee. And my chairman, Chairman Pallone, has stood up a working group, which I lead alongside Congresswoman Robin Kelly of Illinois, where we will be addressing the healthcare disparities that led to uh, the disproportionate uh, mortality rates in communities of color. We talk about black and brown native, native uh, communities were also and continue to be also very hard hit by the COVID-19 crisis. When you live in a food desert, when uh, you, know, you go to the hospital only when uh, you're very ill, uh, you, you, you are predisposed in many ways uh, to uh, horrible healthcare outcomes. And we've known about these disparities in, in Black communities for quite some time, hypertension, uh, blood, um, uh, you know, uh, diabetes, all of these uh, were things that COVID-19 sought out in its victims. And unfortunately, uh, because we had not really addressed uh, the social determinants of health in our communities, we became victims of, of this crisis. Okay, I think we have run out of time. <laughs> we, should, we should have been able to extend this program to one hour, but um, when we come back uh, with a follow-up program, we'll be talking about COVID and the inequities that we see uh, very evident in this epidemic. Um, I want to thank you for being my guest, uh, Congresswoman Yvette Clark. Uh, Reverend Alfred Cockfield, I haven't seen you in a long time from God's Battalion Church, and Dr. Torian Easterling, uh, who is Deputy Commission at New York uh, City Department of Health. Thank you for being our guest on Brooklyn 45. And uh, just before we say goodbye, we want to invite uh, all of our viewers to partner with Brooklyn 45. You can do so in several ways. You can suggest topics for us to discuss, issues that concern you, that you, you want us to provide information about. And you can also be a supporter of Brooklyn 45. You can go to our website, www.brooklyn45.com, and uh, become a supporter. Uh, I, Press the donate button. Don't be afraid to press the donate button. And uh, you can go to our Facebook page and uh, like us and post a comment about this program. On behalf of all of our team, uh, Lisa and uh, Dondre and uh, Reggie and Carla and uh, our entire Brooklyn 45 team, uh, thank you for viewing and uh, goodbye.